is it time for Baku yet? Welcome back to the Grid Talk podcast. This is episode 273 and today we will be taking stock of an epic opening three rounds and assessing just how the driver pairings have played out so far. I'm your host Tom Horrocks and today I'm joined by sports journalist and podcaster Aaron Harper. Hello. Hello and Grip Strip podcast Drip, grip, strip podcast host Philip Matthew. Hello. Hello. And also joining us on this week's podcast, we have our sponsor, Bet Online. Bet Online remains your number one source for all college basketball betting this season, if that is your sport of choice. Get analysis of every play, prop, and point at Bet Online. You'll find the latest odds, bracket contests, team matchups, and game trends at Bet Online. Updated odds for everything from live games, the conference championships, right through to the final four. And the championship game. Bet Online is your college basketball headquarters this season. Head to the website today to use your mobile or use your mobile device to sign in and receive your 50% welcome bonus for your first deposit. Be sure to use our promo code Believe, that's B-L-E-A-V, to receive your bonus. Bet Online, where the game starts. Do I sound like I know what college basketball is there, guys? <laughs> I have no idea about college basketball. Do you follow college basketball, Phil? Not a lot. I the NCAA tournament though is a big deal here, and uh, UConn won for the men for the fifth time in the last like twenty four years, and in the women's, the LSU Lady Tigers won, and there was a lot of controversy from that one. But. Excellent. Okay. Well, hopefully, I sounded like I knew what I was talking about there. Because uh, full disclosure, I had no, I have no idea about college basketball. But um, you responsible gamblers out there would have had an exciting time predicting the first three races this season. I'm sure quite a few of you had Max Verstappen to win certainly the second and third race of the season, as it uh, as it panned out to be. But today we are focusing on the team dynamics. So the uh, we're throwing out the performance out the window. It's a level playing field. Just how the teams got on against each other so we're going to start with you then phil and you're going to have williams so logan Sargent, two one up in race results but three nil down in qualifying with alex alban scoring the only point how have you rated the american start to life in f1 against alex alban i mean considering what williams is tom i mean uh and ha being a rookie relative inexperience only one year in f2 uh, Logan's, uh, I guess you would say that expectations would be lower, but relative to who he replaced, he's doing a much better job than who he replaced. Um, also, the car seems to be slightly better, albeit they're still in the back. Alex Albon, the health issues he had last year, it seems like he's recovering or recovered. The team has pace. They're able to make Q2 generally, and you know they can grind out a result. And considering that part of the field, there is more opportunity this year than there has been in recent years. So, I mean, yes, I think Albon is going to end up by far beating him at the end, beating Sargent by the end of 23 races. Um, the qualifying aspect for Logan, he's kind of been off. I mean, Baku, he should have probably beaten Albon, but then they nailed him for a penalty that he said wasn't being called during practice. So, um once he gets to some of the European circuits where he's run F2 and F3, we may see a little bit of a change there qualifying-wise. But balance and experience-wise, Albon should be able to beat him over the season. I think the greater thing is let him get, get the laps, let him get the seat time, get a point maybe here and there, and be a great representation for the U.S. as a driver since we haven't had one since 2006 in a full-time capacity. Or 2005 actually yeah i mean i was a big fan of logan Sargent in his in his formula three season with uh fighting oscar piastri for the championship and uh obviously not getting into a decent car the following year thought that might have been his his shot gone but uh i'm glad he's got a shot and he's certainly proving a few people wrong i was undecided as to whether he was ready for formula one or not but he certainly impressed me in those in those opening races so far and uh and had the the lap that didn't exist if it had just watched his braking a little bit more he could could well have scored a couple of points for for Williams already this season so uh, he's definitely he's definitely close 
But uh, Aaron, we'll move on to you, and you have the honour of discussing the uh, the Alpha Tori team, which uh, which the, uh, the the team boss is is very complimentary of his engineers over the uh, over the last few weeks. We've got Sonoda, a very very divisive driver, it has to be said, against the much lauded Nick De Vries. He's definitely not a rookie, but he's definitely a rookie, Nick De Vries. And um, one of only two drivers this year, Yuki Sonoda, who has beaten his teammate in all three qualifying sessions and all three race sessions. That's something that I don't think a lot of people would have picked at the start of the year. How do you think it's gone? Well, if you're Yuki Sonoda, it's looking really good so far. And he's kind of stepped up to the plate, two 11th places and a 10th place courtesy of Carlos Sainz's uh, very dodgy penalty, to be honest, in Australia. But he was on the pace. He's there, thereabouts on the fringes of the midfield. His teammate Nick DeVries has clearly struggled with this car, which isn't the Alpha Tauri that we hoped it might be. It's another struggle bus kind of car. And Snowden, I think, has an advantage in that he drove the car last year. So he knows maybe the quirks or the difficulties that you can come across with the, the philosophy that they've got and the way they're going about things. So I'm not surprised that he's beating DeVries. I'm surprised that he's as consistent as he's been because that's something that we've long wanted from, from Yuki Tsunoda because he came onto the scene in Formula 2 and Formula 1, this breath of fresh air, really fast, feisty, you know, likes a, a quick whip over the, the team radio as well. But he seems to have calmed that down a bit. And it just seems to be falling into place, which is great for him because the talent is certainly there. It was just about putting it together. As for De Vries, it's just getting himself under the table there. You, you can't really read into anything after three races. He got uh, biffed off by Logan Sargent and he he might have come through that chaos in Australia to pick up a, a point or something had they kept that, that order or whatever they decided to do at the restart. But... The Alfa Tauri, while it's tricky, potentially maybe the slowest car on the grid, because Williams have definitely got their act together, as, as Phil was talking about. But Sonoda is doing a good enough job with that car to get it into places it perhaps doesn't deserve to be, if that makes sense. But there's, there's more to come from Alfa Tauri. They're the B team of Red Bull. And with a dominant Red Bull, Alfa Tauri really should be solidly in the midfield. So they're kind of stuck with what they've got at the moment. So hopefully development is coming from Fianza. But Franz Toss doesn't trust his engineers anymore, his designers. So good luck with that. Yeah, it certainly seems to be a quite difficult uh, difficult place to work at the moment. And they don't seem to have adapted to the new rule set very well at all. And probably the team that's gone the fallen the furthest. And Williams certainly in the ballpark with them now. And, uh, and although I think probably Alfa Torre may have a slightly faster car, I think... Williams have got a car that in a few races will be able to score a hat full of points and that might be enough to see them ahead of them so uh, it's it's certainly uh, certainly a difficult place for a rookie to uh, to to find himself and given that he had a, a pick of teams as well he had you know there was a possibility of even the Alpine seat and uh, and he ended up going with the Red Bull program and thinking oh you know it might be his chance to get into Red Bull but I I, I worry for Nick DeVries I do worry for Nick DeVries I, I think it's uh, um it's no, you know, it's no insult on Yuki Sonoda, who we know has got pace. But yeah, I, I do worry for, I do worry for him. But uh, we'll come back to you, Phil. And another American connection for you with with the Haas team came back with one point. Hulkenberg was six, and Hulkenberg takes a three nil qualifying lead going into the uh, going into this this early season break. Has some um, has Hulkenberg absolutely got the measure of of K Mag, or is it just kind of circumstance? I would think it's circumstance. I'm honestly surprised that Hulkenberg not being in a full-time seat for all this time and coming right back into it with all these new, uh, the new arrow and some of the other technical aspects just jumps right in and is, is fast. Uh, I mean, well, to be, that's, uh, that's, that's, a, a, uh, that's, uh, I'll reword that he's been able to be at or above K mag early in the season. K Mag last year was resoundingly better, but then he's going against a very young um, driver who the year before was driving with a, a lamppost. And then this, the second year, he's having to drive with an experienced driver who literally was hired a week before. Um, 
In this case, I think K-Mag will come back. The balance will be there between those two guys. What the car will be as the season goes on is to be determined. They actually are trying to develop the car compared to recent years. Um, and I they, because with the veteran combination, they have less of a chance of damage, hopefully. And that means more opportunities for data. And they can battle with the likes of Williams, with uh, the um, Alpha Tori team. And I mean, points depending on the Ferrari power unit, points on depending on their, uh, their uh, what do you call their own calls can happen depending on the track. Uh, I am pleasantly surprised that Nico has been able to just jump right back in. It kind of feels like what K Mag did last year, but I also think that K Mag, slow start to the year, knew he had this little reset. I think once we get back to Baku here in a few weeks' time, I think the balance will start to shift back over to his side of the of the garage. Yeah, it's um, uh, it's certainly been a surprise, definitely, with Hulkenberg coming in so fast. And I, I was one of the people that was like, you know, he's he's had his chance. He's you know, he was a, uh, a pot potential world champion, as, as people were touting him, and uh, and and the whole podium statistic that everyone loves to talk about. And I, I thought he'd had his chance, but uh, I'm glad to see that he's doing well. Genuinely, I think he's uh, he was always one of those guys. I remember speaking to a, to a couple of Germans, say, uh, at a Grand Prix when I, when I was lucky enough to go to the Canadian Grand Prix, and, and they were saying that Hulkenberg is the one they cheer for, not Rosberg, not Vettel. It's Hulkenberg is the one that they cheer for. This is back in 2017. And... Uh, and so it's it's good to see that he's got another chance because he is a bit of a, a fan favourite amongst the Germans and it be you know, we need we need the German fans to have someone to cheer for. So moving on to Alfa Romeo then, Aaron. Um Joe and Bottas. Bottas has got double the points of Joe, but only six points in total for the team, and Joe does lead two one in qualifying and in overall results. So do the points lie or does does Bottas still have an edge here? Well, Joe has certainly been much closer to Bottas than last year, round one in Bahrain, uh, they were 12th and 13th on the grid. And this is the, obviously, Joe has since out-qualified Bottas twice in a row, but they were separated by just three hundredths of a second in Q2. And, you know, that, that's pretty good going. And in Q1, uh, there was less than a tenth, or just over a tenth between them. Um, so Joe has certainly stepped up his performance. And I think Bottas has been having a few struggles. He said that there was potentially damage to the car in Saudi Arabia, which is why he was completely off the pace that weekend. And of course, Joe got the points in Australia because what well, Bottas had an absolute shocker down under, which, you know, he'd grown the tash for, he had the mullet, he had the helmet, and then he didn't have the, the weekend to match it, unfortunately. But that, that just seems to be the life of Valtteri Bottas. You know, he, he puts it all together in a way... You think, yeah, this is all going to come together for him, but it doesn't quite. It's been a, a weird start to the season to, to read Alfa, Alfa Romeo's performance because obviously Bottas eighth in Bahrain and then a fortunate P9 for Joe in Australia. And the pace is just either it's really strong or it's really poor because they were both knocked out in Q1 in Australia. So it's difficult to know quite where they fall in the the midfield hierarchy, I can't work out if they're eighth or ninth fastest or if they're fifth or sixth or seventh fastest. So it's it's probably just one for those for like a track specific thing, but that will be that will become clearer as we have more races and we've got three very four very different races coming up. Next we've got Baku, then we go to Miami and then we go to Imola and then it's Monaco. So they're all going to ask different questions of the cars, even though they're going to carry very similar characteristics in being quite narrow in, in terms of track width. But how Alfa Romeo pick up the points through there is going to be really interesting for the rest of their season, because honestly, I don't see them challenging the midfield as strongly as they did, at least in the first half of last year. It's a bit more of a continuation of the second half of 2022, where they were scrapping for the odd P10, P9, and like Bottas would get the odd Q3 appearance, but we haven't got quite that far with them yet. But hopefully they can deliver something because in Bottas and Joe, they've got two very handy drivers. 
Yeah, absolutely. I don't know if it's Bottas just kind of tailing off or or Joe really raising his game, but he's definitely a lot closer. And he was getting closer all through last year as well. I, I get the feeling that had Alfa Romeo kept the, the same competitiveness all season, Joe would have been a lot closer to Bottas come the end of the year. So uh, so long may that continue. And uh, it's I, I can see Bottas coming under pressure. I really can, especially with a, with a certain Daniel Ricciardo looking to rejoin the grid. Alfa Romeo seemed to be realistically... The only team I think would probably look at him if, if they were looking as a direct replacement for Valtteri Bottas, but uh, that's my hot take. But moving on to you then, Phil, you get our beloved McLaren. Myself and Aaron um, aren't going to cry into our microphones, so we're going to allow you to talk about uh, Lando and Oscar, both getting off the mark in Australia. Lando hasn't destroyed Oscar, as some people predicted, and how have you rated their performance overall so far in a difficult car? Yeah, I mean, I think for Oscar Piastri, with everything... You know, coming in is the momentum he's had and the potential he has shown in lower formulas. You would have, I think, for Lando, he would actually have to work for the first time. Uh, he had to work with Carlos uh, because Carlos gave him a, a real battle. And we've seen that no matter what team that Carlos Sainz has driven at. Um, Daniel Ricardo fell off the face of the planet, but he actually won a race um, lest anyone forget that he he's the last winner for McLaren in formula one and um, Lando's the golden boy of their team. They developed him. He was the junior guy. They've developed him from a young age. So they look at him in a lot of ways, like a certain seven time world or eight time world champion, honestly. Um, but the, but the thing is, Lando, when is he going to come up and make that next step? This car is not going to help their cause, but once they figure it out, once they start making these adjustments, uh, hopefully they can rise back towards Alpine, which is where they were racing against last year. Um, they are definitely a step behind what is considered the top three teams on the grid at the moment. Um, but even, I guess, four. Um, so, they're trying to battle for fifth right now, and um, they have a chance to getting off the, getting uh, out of the rut there in Australia. Getting double points was a good thing, good momentum shift, and going to Baku um, with new upgrades, they may be able to kind of restart their season, and that one's going to go the whole way. I think the whole year, that's going to go, and they're going to be one of the more interesting team dynamics that we're going to have to watch because they're both young. They're both fast. They're really fiery and they want to be the guy. And Oscar Piastri didn't see potential at his previous uh, employer. He saw potential here at McLaren and he looks at Lando Norris and he says, well, I can beat him. And that's the first time that I think Lando Norris has really had to work for it in a while. And this is going to be a test of his mettle. Um, and what he really wants from his career too. So honestly, like the driver combination there, um, they just need to actually give him a car that's functional um, and can actually go fast and not stink. And then we, they'll probably have, they'll probably be able to battle up there for some decent points. Um, the days of yesteryear when they would always win have unfortunately passed for the moment, but they do have the combination to get back there in the driver in the driver's seat yeah absolutely unfortunately those days are well behind us the the, the days of sort of uh, 1998 the last constructors championship and uh, and even those you know those those performances in the in the late 2000s and I, I just look back at those those years and that's just like I, I thought that was the the norm and now it's it's just a long long way away but uh, I, I still count Landon Norris as winning the uh, Russian Grand Prix in 2020 despite that 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 blasted rain that blasted rain but uh anyway we'll move on then to uh to alpine and i've, I've saved you the pain of talking about uh, mclaren aaron and uh, you get the french super team instead ocon and gasly promised quite a lot but just four points apiece so far ocon edges gasly in qualifying but gasly edges ocon in the races so what does separate these guys not a lot, as we saw from uh, the Australian Grand Prix. <laughs> you took the words right out of my mouth. Um, I mean, from an Alpine point of view, this is your perfect midfield combination lineup because they've got a car that is midfield. 
So you need two very good midfield operators to get the most out of it. Look at what Haas are getting with Hulkenberg and when Magnussen gets his act together, they'll have that in both cars. So Alpine are giving themselves the best possible chance to be at the top of the midfield. The problem for them is that the top three has become a top four because Aston Martin have delivered, I don't know, a monster in terms of their, what they've been developing over the last couple of years. And, well, let, let's not get into the copying debate today. <laughs> we'll save that for somewhere else. Um, but Alpine have done a good job. Uh, Ocon, as you say, has edged qualifying, but obviously Gasly had his times deleted in uh, qualifying in Bahrain. So the, the most relevant two qualifiers that you can take are Jeddah and Australia, where it's one apiece. Uh, they both got to Q3 in Jeddah and Ocon put it in P7 and Gasly was P10. Ocon was a little bit unfortunate with some traffic in qualifying two in Australia. So it's a very even contest there. You look at the points, they've both got four points. So Ocon's got the edge in qualifying, but he's ahead in the championship because of a P8 that he's got uh, versus LP, uh, versus Gasly's pair of P9s, which if you're playing poker would be a better hand. But in this case, it's not so good for him. Uh, it leaves him a couple of places below his teammate. And obviously they've had that collision in Australia, which I think they've taken actually in, in very mature uh, fashion because I think everyone was just waiting for them to be the first drivers to come together within a team and then just see how that unfolded. Obviously, they might be showing a, a more professional face and whereas in, internally, it could be a little bit more fractious and we'll just have to wait and see how that pans out. If they get close together in Baku, especially in the sprint, that could be interesting. Um, but at the moment, it's fairly even Stevens. Um, they're looking in, in decent shape as a team and the, the collision in Australia aside, it's all, you know, fairly rosy at Alpine at the moment between the two drivers. Yeah, well, the uh, the the L plan without Alonso seems to be seems to be uh, bubbling along in a, uh, a less than convincing manner at the moment. But but uh, hopefully for their sake they can uh, they, they they can pick up some because some decent results because they seem to be they seem to be better than they're showing at the moment but uh, we'll uh, we'll wait and see on that one Phil lucky you you get Ferrari Sainz with uh, with 20 points three results in his favor and a 2-1 lead in qualifying Leclerc with just six points but it could have been worse for Leclerc without that late penalty from Sainz I mean, what what's is it really this bad for Leclerc or and has Sainz stepped up or is it just again is it just bad luck? Well, I think it's just bad luck. It's Ferrari, you know, Ferrari being Ferrari. When you consider that their pace right now is around the same as they have the good one lap pace, but in the race, they're behind or at the same level in some ways as the Mercedes and the, uh, the Aston. So that is falling backwards, which is not a good thing. You also add the fact that, you know, you have the dominant figure out there that they're way, they're falling behind that. Mercedes is going to come with a, a new side pod um, concept for Baku. Aston Martin has a strong car and one driver that is very determined. How are you going to do three against two just there? I don't know how they're going to do that. They need to give Leclerc something to work with that'll actually run a whole entire race. That'd be a novel concept. Um, the fact that Carlos Sainz is better with his equipment has been a case his whole entire career, no matter where he's been. I think every year he just kind of improves. He makes that little bit more incremental changes. I think he's also motiva motivated by the fact that um, Connor Moore does him very well. So he knows that if he doesn't do well, then there's a possibility he might get replaced uh, in that sense. And it's not like Ferrari would really notice, but because uh, he's Carlos Sainz, driver for Ferrari. And, um, you know, so the thing is with them, they they need to get out, get out of their way, really, and um, give these guys something. It's, it's a similar kind of conversation as it is with McLaren. You have a good combination there. You have a driver in Leclerc who, on one lap, can compete with anybody on the grid. Um, his race craft is not the greatest. 
on the other hand, Signs is very good in the race. Qualifying has not been his forte. He's taken the advantage early this year, but 23 races, I think that'll balance out. Now losing, they need to be making more points. Uh, they don't want to finish fourth in the constructors to a Mercedes customer and the Mercedes team who brought a dog to the deal at the start of the race, season and they're still ahead of them. You know, like that's not going to be a good look for them. But, you know, they always blame the team principal or this guy or that guy or the person that made the wrong pasta sauce. It's never anybody who builds the cars or designs the cars or anything like that. So it's typical Ferrari in that sense. I always love coming to you for Ferrari. <laughs> I mean, yeah, it's, um, yeah. I picked them for Constructors' Championship this year, and uh, although I, I did, uh, I did pick in my predictions that Gasly would get a race ban after a collision with Ocon. So I guess what I was hoping for in the stewards' room at the end of the last race, but uh, my Ferrari prediction has uh, has not has not come through at all, and I can only see it getting worse. I can see them finishing fourth this year, genuinely can. But uh, the team that's uh, has made a big step and nowhere near as big as they had hoped is uh, the most dynamic and interesting battle of the year, really falls to you, Aaron, is, is Hamilton and Russell. Very much the opposite to last year, with uh, with Russell very much losing out in the opening exchanges in the races, but um, very, very much on top of Hamilton in the qualifying. It's uh, 3-0 on qualifying, but just the one race result um, ahead of Hamilton, 38 points to 18. Doesn't tell the true story, the points, surely. No, the, the points, as it was last year, are a bit of a, a fake news story, uh, to coin a phrase there, and especially from Mercedes' point of view, because you, you know that if you give both those drivers a race-winning car, they're going to go and win races with it. But the problem that Mercedes have got is they've got a car that doesn't suit either of their drivers perfectly, I would say. They've got slightly different driving styles. Lewis likes it a bit more on the nose. George is very smooth but the points obviously tell a story and the story that it tells is that Lewis is doing enough in races to be ahead of George at the moment obviously Russell had the the uh, power unit failure in Australia and that can happen at any time just you know Lewis knows that from 2016 a power unit can cost you a world championship so Lewis's consistency in regard to his discomfort that he's voicing in the car in terms of the seat position and the feeling that he's not getting from the car. He's actually been quite eloquent in explaining that, in that you need to be able to feel what the rear is going to do and, and how that affects the way he drives. That That's testament to how good he is as a driver. But George obviously can't be exactly comfortable in that car because it's not the fastest car out there. So he's still doing a very good job. He'll be disappointed with Bahrain with only a P7 for that. But Saudi Arabia... Excellent drive. When he needed to get on with it, he did. He pulled away from Hamilton in the race. And in Australia, he got the lead. Had the safety car stayed a safety car for Albon's accident, he could have been in a really, really good position, providing his engine didn't go pop. But in all likelihood, it would have. So he was never really on course to win that race anyway. But still, you know, the, the performance from both drivers is there. They're doing everything they can with that car. What has really impressed me is George Russell's performance in qualifying. And that is a great barometer, I think, of a top-line driver. If you think about Senna, Schumacher, Verstappen, uh, Hamilton, they all came on the scene and they had blistering one lap pace. And then they matured that into racecraft. And George has got that, that one lap pace and he's going to develop that racecraft. We've already seen it. He's very good wheel-to-wheel. -wheel. So... They've got two unbelievable drivers and a car that's, dare I say it, not worthy of either, either of them because it's just not acceptable for Mercedes, the standards that they've set, to be delivering a car like that. And I'm glad that they finally admitted that these things called side pods are you know, probably quite fundamental to a Formula One car's performance. So uh, well done for that. Nice, yeah. Yeah, those eight world championships certainly seem a long way away at the moment. And uh, you, you say an engine can cost you a world championship, and uh, seemingly so can uh, a 90 year old irrelevant man, 15 years after the fact, is trying to cost him a world championship as well. But uh, I'm not touching that one for 50 foot barge pole. Moving on to uh, the. the um 
Uh, the uh, I've completely lost my train of thought there after that, but uh, your old mate Fred, then Phil, he's uh, got a new lease of life injected in his veins this year. But uh, Stroll, pro surely his most impressive season so far, especially given what he's been through. Yeah, I mean, for Stroll, you look at some of the teammates he's had since he's went to his dad's team, and I mean, Checo was there and definitely outpaced him, and uh, you had Sebastian on, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that that's true. Um, then Sebastian was on the back end of his career, but even in his when he had it working, he could go out there and almost won Hungary a couple of years ago. But this is a different uh, situation, and that El Plan is very motivated and wants to prove that he's still that guy that, you know, what is it, 15 years ago or 17 years ago uh, was a world champion and won the vast majority of his 32 Grand Prix um, in that time frame. And uh, he's let multiple world championships go since then do i think he's going to win the world championship this year no but he's going to have a chance to finish in the top five which uh don't think has happened since he left ferrari so um that's a, a big plus for them i am curious to see how they will respond if and when in mercedes makes their upgrades and ferrari gets out of their own way um will they be able to keep up with those two teams will they be able to make the uh, upgrades that they need to to stay in this position. I don't really doubt Alonso's ability to compete. Um, in the case of Stroll, he strolled, whatever. The fact that he he's just driving is, I mean, yeah, he had some health issues earlier in the year, so the fact that he's driving is good or whatever. But um, we're not. We're he's there just to get constructors points. Um, he may show up one qualifying or one or two races this year and really put something on, but Alonso is going to take him to the woodshed. Um, like every teammate basically has ever done to Lance Stroll that's actually been halfway decent. So um, for Aston, they're looking to, I think, I think if they can finish third in the constructors championship, it'd be a huge uh, gain and huge uh, uh, progress for them as an organization from where they have been the last few years. Yeah, absolutely. I think seventh to third is a huge, huge jump. And I, I think that's um, maybe McLaren might have done it from 2019 to 2020. I can't remember where they finished in 2019. Probably I think about maybe even sixth or seventh, sixth, probably sixth place. But but that's a massive, massive jump. And uh, and yeah, I can see Fernando Alonso potentially finishing even higher than, than fifth in the championship with uh, seeing how, how the Ferraris are going and, and, uh, and with, uh, with Sergio Perez potentially not, uh, not performing. I can, I can see that happening as well, but uh, we'll move on to the most pointless debate of the season then for you, Aaron. The, uh, although it is, it is uh, two, one in race results with, with, with Perez and Verstappen and um, same in qualifying, but uh <sighs> Is there is there is there really a fight, or is it just a matter of uh, you know just a matter of fact that Verstappen's uh, not had a completely clean few races? Well, bar for a drive shaft in qualifying in Saudi Arabia, it would be three 0 on both fronts to Verstappen. I mean, Perez can do everything he can possibly do within that team, but he'll never usurp Verstappen. They won't let that happen. I mean, if we, we, we look back over history and Ross Braun and the old Ferrari guys would always say, oh, well, if Rubens Barrichello had just put himself in front of Michael Schumacher, he'd have got the backing too. Not true, because those drivers don't let that happen. But Schumacher would have done something to, you know, undermine Barrichello's efforts. Verstappen would probably be able to do something similar. I'm not saying he'll do underhand tactics, but it's just generally they'll do something on the track that will get them ahead and force the team's hand. So the argument that Perez can finish ahead of Verstappen is almost irrelevant. It's a case of what sort of job is Perez going to do for Red Bull. And this year, because the car is so dominant, it's almost, almost a slam dunk one-two driver's title finish and a constructor's championship. And if they don't get a driver's title one-two, then Perez has a real problem. He's got to stay close to Verstappen. 
And he did that in the first two races. The performances were good. And he beat Verstappen on merit, you'd say, in Jeddah, because he'd earned pole position because his car didn't break down. And he won the race because he'd done a good enough job. And he was matching Verstappen's times in that final phase of the race. But Australia is the big outlier. Yes, he had a car problem, but then you've got to be forceful enough to, to make sure that, that doesn't happen. Personally, I think he should have been higher up the order. The, the performance that car had, I think he should have come through the field a lot quicker. He was only at P6 and 7, like Hulkenberg and Norris, with 18 laps to go. I think Verstappen showed in Jeddah, yeah, slightly different tracks, but again, power of the DRS. Verstappen showed in, in Jeddah that he, he just makes the moves. That's what sets him apart from a driver like Perez. That's what puts Verstappen up there in the top echelon of drivers with the other greats, whatever you think of him. So it is, it is a very one-sided debate here. It's, it's Verstappen all the way. Perez will sneak a few victories when Verstappen... Well, he needs to sneak a few victories this year when problems fall Verstappen's way. It's just a question of how many times uh, problems get in the way of the Dutchman. And when, if and when they do, are they Red Bull related or are they Mercedes finally getting their act together or Fernando Alonso doing something absolutely magical or Ferrari getting their act together for that, for that point as well. So it's, I know it looks like a foregone conclusion, but it really is Red Bull's title to lose this year already. Yeah, it's a, it's a it's a stark reality, unfortunately, and uh, it's a bit of a bit of a glum note to end on, really. But uh, that's on me because I decided the order. So uh, apologies for that if I've ruined your ruined your season. But please tune in and watch Formula One because we've got a we've got a huge amount to come. We've got Aston Martin with forty percent more wind tunnel time, Mercedes with thirty. 20% more wind tunnel time than than uh, than Red Bull Ferrari again from their second place have got a bit more wind tunnel time as well so they 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 should close up on on Red Bull to a degree and Red Bull inevitably to try and offset their penalty for the wind tunnel time will switch off development early so i think towards the end of the season you will see some uh, some great battles for race wins however whether it be for a championship I'm slightly less convinced, but uh, there's lots of great racing to come for Formula One, so please stick with it, and uh, and we, we will uh, really enjoy reporting on it. But if you've enjoyed this podcast, we would love it if you could leave us a five-star rating on Spotify and a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. And if you're one of those pesky listeners who are not yet subscribed to our channel, why not subscribe now and ensure you never miss a show again, and make sure you click the bell to know when we go live. Last time I was hosting Grid Talk, I said that we should uh, we should target 1,000 subscriptions before the summer break. We've now just hit 2,000 subscribers, so thank you all for your incredible support. We've more than doubled our subscribers in a very short period of time, so thank you very much for that, and keep on subscribing. Before we go, Aaron, would you like to give us the obligatory plug for, for you and your work? Uh, so I'm a journalist uh, in the south of England, but I also have a Formula One channel, AHGP, uh, so I cover Formula One, obviously, a bit of Formula Two, a bit of Formula E. So I do Formula E watch-alongs of all the races. Uh, they've been pretty wild this year, which has uh, been a lot of fun. Uh, from time to time, I do some F1 manager uh, streams as well. There's shorts, there's all sorts. Um, Phil's been a guest on my podcast, which we discussed uh, pre-season stuff and a bit of the Andretti um, information from an American point of view. Uh, Tom, you're about to be on and we're going to talk some Formula E. Uh, so come and uh, subscribe to my channel. I've just ticked over 200 subscribers, which is much less than Grid Talk. But still, for me, just that's really cool. Can't believe that 200 people want to listen to me waffle, to be honest. Um, but yeah, that's that's where you'll find me. And you can find me on Twitter uh, at AHGPPod and at Aaron Harper 41 Okay, and spoiler alert, your ch your uh, podcast will air before this one. I'm uh, I I'm pretty certain as we've got a few other podcasts to go out first. So uh, so I hope you enjoyed that podcast where I made an absolute fool of myself talking about Formula E. But uh Phil, would you like to talk talk about the Grip Strip Pod and uh, and tell us more about that? Grip Strip Podcast, we've been around for over 160 episodes myself and Josh are fine. We go over all things motorsports in the United States and in in the world of racing. We talk about Formula One, we talk about IndyCar, NASCAR, uh, the way I always say it, if it goes fast, we probably talk about it on the Grip Strip podcast. 
Uh, we got episode 163 coming up here. We're going to post and uh, sun on this coming week. We'll do episode 164. Very light uh, schedule, of course, for this Easter weekend. Um, weather permitting, there will be NASCAR this weekend. But otherwise, um, we'll go and talk about uh, that. We talk about all the junior formulas as well, like Formula 2, Formula 3, and We'll talk about the new um, Academy series for the F1 for the ladies, and um, we'll uh, keep on going with that and uh, keep on coming on over here. So um, great job, Tom, and thanks again to Aaron and for having me on his show. And Tom, you've been on my show as well uh, a couple of years ago. So it's good that we all get to collab together, not here, not just here on the F1 uh, Grid Talk, but helping each other out on our own shows. So um, Great job as always and great to be on with you guys. Thank you. Great. Thank you as well for coming on. And we've got to get you on monkey seat at some point uh, this year, this season. It's, uh, it's, it's long overdue. So, yeah, if you want to follow me, I'm at Tom Horrocks F1 on, on Twitter. And we run the, the Monkey Seat podcast, myself and Carl. And, of course, um, we uh, I'm also part of F1 Chronicle and F1 Grid Talk podcast. So um, stay tuned for more Grid Talk content as we fill the void that F1 has bestowed upon us. All our race shows do go out live on YouTube straight after the event. And the audio version goes out slightly slightly later which is available on amazon fire spotify google podcasts apple music verbal and pocket casts we also run a patreon to help us continue doing what we're doing so please consider donating to us everything does go back into the show to improve your experience so thank you very much to everyone and of course uh, our sponsor for this episode as well um we will see you soon goodbye